Whenever you're shopping for a new Mac, there's always a little bit of uncertainty. How much RAM do you need? Will those extra CPU cores really make a difference? Or should you shell out for a larger SSD? Well, these are all questions and decisions that you will have to make while also taking into consideration your budget and how long you plan to use your Mac. And like most companies, Apple has figured out the best way to squeeze as much money out of you as possible. And I've seen some people either rightly or wrongly, refer to it as a sort of scam. I mean, just take a look at all the upgrade options for the 14-inch MacBook Pro. It can get really confusing. and You kind of feel like you're missing out if you don't upgrade anything. And that's exactly how most laptop manufacturers want you to feel. And this is where the concept of future-proofing comes in. Just because that slightly more powerful or capable upgrade exists, doesn't necessarily mean you should get it. And in my opinion, future-proofing is one of the biggest mistakes people make when buying a new Mac and can end up wasting hundreds of dollars. So in this video, I'm going to explain a couple of things, including will the apps and software you use become harder to run in the future? What upgrades should you actually get? And why does Apple give you so many often confusing upgrade options now? Are they just after your cash? Well, I mean, yeah, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. So first of all, what is future-proofing? Well, the easiest way I can explain it is the practice of ensuring your Mac can handle new technologies, software, and requirements that it may encounter in the future. The key word in that sentence is may. The basic logic behind this strategy is that your computer will be able to run programs and software in the future, even if they become more demanding or at least experience less of a performance drop. Now, future-proofing can take several forms. For example, choosing a more powerful CPU or buying the latest model of a certain Mac product line rather than the previous year's model. For example, an M2 MacBook Air instead of an M1, or even something as simple as a slightly bigger SSD in case apps take up more storage space in the future. Future-proofing is often seen as an alternative to buying a new Mac every few years. And it's particularly popular with those who intend to keep their device for a long time. However, future-proofing, in my opinion, is a flawed concept and may actually turn out to be a poor strategy and waste of money for many people. So let's find out why. But just before that, you know what isn't a waste of money? The new X3 action camera from Insta360. Move over GoPro with 360 degree capture, action ready hardware and AI powered software, Insta360 X3 is the next generation of the world's best selling 360 action camera. X3 makes it easy and most importantly, fun to capture and share your life. Anyone can now create viral worthy content with ease from social media aficionados to adventurers or adrenaline junkies looking to capture their best highlights. The X3 has incredible features like an upgraded half inch sensor allowing for 5.7K, 360 degree video that can capture everything, so you can shoot first and reframe later. The invisible selfie stick disappears in your edit, enabling you to capture impossible third person perspectives. And with flow state stabilization, the horizon stays level thanks to 360 horizon lock. With a two-in-one camera design, the Insta360 X3 supports single lens mode in full 4K resolution, just like a traditional action camera. So make sure you check out the Insta360 X3 using the link in the description below to get a free invisible selfie stick. Now to preface what I'm about to cover in this video, I'm certainly not saying that CPU, GPU, RAM or SSD upgrades are useless. I'm specifically talking about upgrading these things just in case, where you'll likely never take advantage of them. So let's start with the first point I want to make here. Let's be honest, most people only use their Mac for very basic tasks. These usually include things like web browsing, emails, Word documents, or the occasional video call. And these tasks aren't really that demanding. In fact, I have a decade old base model 2013 MacBook Pro that can do all of this with zero issues. Sure, it's not as fancy or snappy as the latest Apple Silicon MacBooks with their new screens and better webcams, but for actually doing these simple everyday tasks, you'll barely notice a difference. And this brings me to my next point. A common argument I hear in favor of future-proofing is that the programs and websites you frequently use become more demanding 
and difficult to run over time. Now, this is only partially true, so let me break down each area. Starting with web browsing, as the internet evolves and becomes larger and more advanced, it does make sense that computers correspondingly find it harder to load and browse web pages, right? Well, this is an argument I frequently hear when people are deciding between 8 or 16 gigabytes of RAM for their Mac. But is there any truth to this argument? Well, to put it into perspective, I was able to browse the internet using that same 2013 MacBook Pro with zero issues. This decade old device is so old that it's officially classed by Apple as obsolete. Yet I really didn't notice much of a difference between it and my 2022 M2 MacBook Air. The reality is that on average, the internet is becoming more and more optimized as time goes on. Web developers need to ensure their websites are efficient so they load quickly and are compatible with a wide range of devices, many of which are very old, like grandma's 20-year-old PC, or outdated, or are mobile devices with limited internet speed. A website that doesn't load or work well on anything other than the latest and greatest device is a website doomed to have low traffic. And I have personal experience with this on our own website. There's something called Google Page Speed Insights, and its purpose is to essentially rank websites in several factors, particularly speed and compatibility. As a result, developers are incentivized to make websites load as fast as possible while using minimal resources. For example, bloated code is cut down and streamlined, and images are compressed. The result is that the web browsing experience continues to improve and doesn't exactly slow down if you're using older hardware or a device with only eight gigabytes of RAM instead of 16, for example. By the way, if you want a full breakdown on how much RAM you should get, I made a really detailed video comparing all the M2 RAM options that you can watch via a link in the description. Spoiler alert, if you think there's a good chance you need 16 gigabytes of RAM, you probably do. But getting back to performance, what about the apps and programs you have on your actual Mac? like Word, Spotify, or Photoshop, for example. Surely they become more demanding and require a more powerful system to run in the future, right? Well, again, this is only partially true. For your everyday apps like Spotify or Word, there won't be much difference. All of these things still work perfectly, even on older Macs. And sure, professional and demanding apps like the Adobe Suite, video editors, and 3D modeling programs, for example, become more demanding with frequent updates and new features, not to mention often the data and files you work with become more complex. For example, when 4K footage started to become more popular than 1080p just a few years ago. But will those extra two CPU cores, for example, make a difference? Or are you better off simply saving that money you would have spent on future-proofing upgrades and simply upgrade your entire system after a few years? Well, firstly, it depends what you want. I mean, some people like to keep their devices for a long time, and some prefer to upgrade every two to three years to stay on the cutting edge. Both strategies have pros and cons. If you're like me and use demanding apps on a day-to-day -day basis, a good strategy is to buy the exact upgrades you need and will fully utilize for the next two to three years, if you actually need any upgrades in the first place, then sell and move to a new system. And I always sell my used Macs on the second-hand market. And typically I can recover about 60% of the total cost I spent on it brand new due to the high resale value of Mac products. It also helps reduce e-waste because I'm not just throwing my computer in the bin every few years. And I think this strategy is a good middle ground for people who use their Macs for more than just everyday tasks like web browsing and emails. You're able to use the Mac for a few years and just before you start seeing a significant decrease in performance versus new tech, you can sell it to someone who doesn't care about that just wants a decent laptop at a discounted second-hand price. For example, look at the performance differences between just one generation of chips, the M1 and M2. Sure, it's not a huge amount, ranging from about 10% to 25% in real-life tasks. But fast forward five years in the future and make the same comparison, this time between the M1 and the M4, or whatever Apple ends up calling it. 
And if you're a professional editing videos or compiling code, for example, time is money. And don't forget, new tech is constantly being released that can have a massive impact on your workflow. A great example of this are the built-in hardware footage encoders and decoders on Apple Silicon chips. This made a huge difference to video editing workflows in particular, and is only something you can unlock with a new Mac. Just imagine if you bought a fully future-proofed and upgraded 16-inch Intel MacBook Pro in 2020, intending for it to last about five years, only for it to be completely demolished by the Apple Silicon version released just one year later with a ton of new features. I know, I know this is a bit of an extreme example, but hey, it does happen. Luckily, this is really only something that users who use demanding or pro apps have to worry about. If you're just browsing the web, answering emails or writing Word docs, Get whatever you want, and it's gonna be good for many years. This brings us to the final question. What should you upgrade? Well, just answer these two questions. Will you take advantage of this particular upgrade immediately or in the near future? And does it make financial sense? Because you don't wanna go spending money that you don't have. If you answered yes to both questions, hey, maybe that upgrade is a good choice. For example, if you're doing CPU intensive tasks all day, Get those extra CPU cores. Are you a hardcore web browsing multitasker? Upgrade the RAM to 16 gigabytes or maybe even 24 gigabytes. Are you pretty sure that 256 gigabytes of storage won't be enough? Well, get the 512 gigabyte upgrade. But whatever you do, just make sure you buy something that you'll actually take advantage of and use every day. And not something that you might use or will come in handy a couple of years down the track. And if you need help figuring out which upgrades are the best bang for your buck, well, check out videos from channels like this. I go into detail on pretty much everything, and you can watch videos from other channels out there to make sure the results are consistent and you're making the most informed decision. And if you're wondering why there are now so many different upgrade options for the CPU and GPU on Apple Silicon Max, the answer is simple. During the process of manufacturing these chips, Something called chip binning occurs. Basically, the chips with the least amount of defects become the more powerful chips, and the chips that might have slightly more defects get some of their CPU or GPU cores disabled and are marketed as an 8-core CPU instead of a 10-core, for example. So don't think that by not getting an upgraded chip, you're getting an inferior product. Apple offers all these chip variants on their Macs for two reasons. Number one, so they're not wasting silicon. And number two, it gives customers more options to choose from, which also gives Apple a little bit more money. One thing I also wanna talk about are those people who intend to keep their Mac for a long time, like 10 years, for example. There is nothing wrong with that. I know it might seem like this video is saying that getting a new system every few years is the best option, but that option isn't the best choice for everyone. For example, even if you sell your used Mac on the second-hand market, buying a new one every three to four years is still expensive. All I'm trying to say in this video is that don't waste money buying or upgrading things you know you're not going to need or won't make a difference, even 10 years in the future.